This is compost, and most of us would just throw it in the garden. However, there is a group out there that actually throw it into water, steep it, and make a tea. So today's video, we're going to look at the science behind whether or not using or even the claims in regards to compost tea are real. So let's get into it. This was a geek crew request. Many of you actually requested this video. So here we are. And if you did not know, a lot of my video ideas actually come from the comment section. So if you want a video, you put it down below. I, I add it to the list. It doesn't matter what, what the question is, it goes to the list because there's no such thing as a stupid question. And if you want to join the geek crew, they're smarter than I am. All you gotta do is hit the subscribe button. People always say, how much does it cost? It's free. Plus it makes like a little pretty confetti spray now. So it's like satisfying. When it comes to compost tea, there are kind of four big claims out there. Number one is that it adds more nutrients than just regular old compost does. Number two is actually the microbes. Now this seems to be the biggest reason that people use compost tea because the claim is that it actually increases the microbial load inside of the water and therefore inside of the soil. This then obviously helps with soil structure and obviously healthier roots. So that's kind of the main ideas for why we use compost tea. Now there are other claims out there such as throwing it onto the leaves actually helps to prevent against diseases and other pests but we'll actually look into that and discuss that here in a little bit more detail later on in this video. Okay, before we can even discuss the benefits of compost tea, we actually need to look at how compost tea is made because this actually does make a difference. So there are two versions. One is steeping the tea inside of just water that is not aerated. This is anaerobically producing the compost tea. The other version is aerobic. So putting in a bubbler or some way to incorporate oxygen into that water. Now the difference between the two is that bacteria tends to thrive and survive based on oxygen conditions. So we have a set of bacteria that are called anaerobic and we have another set of bacteria that are considered aerobic. Because Geek Crew, you are so genuinely interested in the world of science when it applies to plants and gardening and all that fun stuff, I think this is a tidbit you would enjoy. And I kind of thought this when I was editing, I was like, ah, I should have put this in the actual video itself. But there are five different types of actual bacteria out there. So oftentimes you hear me speak about aerobic or anaerobic. However, there is a middle ground in there. So when I'm talking hard, fast, aerobic versus anaerobic, what I'm speaking to is something called strict anaerobic, strict aerobic, or what I'm speaking to is Stri or um, obligate anaerobe or obligate aerobe, meaning they require either oxygen or no oxygen. And if they are exposed to either or, they die off, okay? But there is a middle ground and the middle ground is what quite often you will see in a compost tea or in a soil that's fully been saturated or in a seed starting setup, for example. Now there's faculative, faculative, uh, anaerobic bacteria, meaning this is bacteria that is exposed just to oxygen on the surface of the water in this case. And then throughout, you may see some bacteria that normally would be aerobic in the anaerobic spaces because it's just, it's, it's hanging out there hoping to hold on until conditions change. But majority you're going to see kind of at that surface because you have that interface where the top of the bucket is going to be exposed to quite a bit of oxygen, but the lower portions of the bucket won't be. So you get a mix between the two. Other version of this is aerotolerant bacteria. Now aerotolerant means they don't care. They don't care. They're actually aerotolerant anaerobic, but besides the point, they just simply don't give AF about the conditions or the oxygen levels. They exist throughout the entire medium universally, regardless of the conditions. And then there is what we call micro aerophilic or phytic, philic, is it philic or phytic? I can't remember. Anyways, it's aero. I gotta look this up. Micro aerophile. It wasn't phytic or phytic, it was file. Anyways, micro aerophile. These guys will find 
oxygen just in the mixture overall and they'll just find like the little pockets and exist in the pockets so they don't exist at the top necessarily they don't exist at the very bottom um unless that's where the oxygen is they kind of just ex exist in between that one is kind of you i mean whatever but the other four are ones you will commonly see or be exposed to now um you can i can go into this in like a more detail but i don't want to do it in this video and confuse everybody and i get too hung up on this but i want you to keep in mind that it's not hard and fast rules like they're they're not always on the extremes they are kind of in the middle if they are on the extremes technically that's an extremophile which is another type of bacteria but that usually more so refers to like temperatures and ph's and that sort of thing but anyways fun facts fun facts one version of anaerobic bacteria that we always encounter as gardeners or even someone who has houseplants is root rot. The other one is actually dampening off. This can also be caused by anaerobic conditions. So anaerobic, not actually putting a bubbler in the tea, it's not a good idea. That one just gets canceled. The next one is aerobic. So this is the one with the bubbler. Now aerobic bacteria is often found in soil, particularly soil that's not compacted and or a heavy clay. They're also heavily pre prevalent in compost piles and in just a healthy soil in general that's light and fluffy, lots of aerobic bacteria. And yes, a lot of bacteria that are beneficial are also aerobic. There are bad guys also that are aerobic too. So do keep that in mind. Now, that means if we're gonna choose the rotocompost tea, we want to go with aerobic teas first and foremost. Not to mention, if you go for anaerobic and then you put it in a watering can and you water your plants with it, you're now oxygenating it and so everything dies anyways because now it's aerobic. So just keep that in mind. Now the next concept kind of deserves a video on its own and it's re in regards to light and how it actually affects plants, microbes, soil, all of it, because UV makes quite a big difference inside of your ecosystem. So UV light, if your compost tea is exposed to high levels of UV light, the heat can obviously harm the bacteria, but the UV rays in and of themselves can also harm the bacteria. And this is true for stuff that is normally below the soil surface that isn't exposed to UV light. Now I used to work with a lot of soil microbes for a company and we had to actually sit in the back of a truck with a cover on top, all the windows blacked out and we would have to put seeds into baggies and then massage the microbes or the slurry of microbes onto the actual seeds and then plant them outdoors. The whole thing was done in the dark because in order to get a viable experiment in that case, we need to limit the light exposure. And that rule still applies to any sort of microbe system, compost heat included. So if you're gonna go the aerobic route, you also wanna make sure it's in an opaque container that is completely covered. Now, there are some dangers when it comes to compost tea. And this goes for any time we're growing microbes, whether it's in a Petri dish or compost tea or fermenting, all of it. Microbes that grow can be harmful. And there are a number of very ugly culprits out there that can do a lot of damage to yourself. Compost teas, even aerated ones, will have potentially some bad stuff in it. So you don't wanna be getting your face close to it. You wanna make sure it's in a very open air rated place. Um, if you're gonna play with it, just be careful. And that goes for anyone. If you're playing with microbes in any capacity, there's a reason why in microbe labs, you are under fumigation hoods. I mean, who knows? The next infectious disease could come from your backyard. You don't want to be that person. This is the part of the video where I'm going to break some hearts. At the end of this video, I promise I'm going to put something that is beneficial and a reason why you may want to use this. But in my humble opinion, take it or leave it, compost tea in general, the claims it's giving, not real. And here's 
why. Okay, number one is the actual physical nutrients. Inside of biomass, for example, this beautiful little kale plant that somehow is just kicking butt through a lot of frost, this entire plant has a set volume of nutrients. It took off so much nitrogen to get this much biomass on it, and this biomass unlike humans, is not able to just continue to get obese. You don't have obese plants. So because of that, there's a finite amount of nutrients, micronutrients, macro, you name it, inside of this kale plant. Now say I was to compost this entire kale plant. The nutrients does not increase. It stays the same. And that is because it's a closed system. And also let's just use logic when it comes to the nutrient thing, you have compost and in said compost, you have not a little tea bag full of kale. You have maybe a whole schwack load of kale. And the more compost you add, the more nutrients, theoretically, you add. So putting less nutrients and then adding water, which dilutes it. You see where I'm going? It's, it's actually less nutrients than just adding the compost. Just saying. Where it gets even worse for the compost tea world is the gassing off of nitrogen. So the nitrogen cycle has various different forms of nitrogen that it all ends up in. And NH4, ammonia, is actually one that gasses off. And this is a loss of nitrogen from the system. In the world of soil science, we call it volatilization, which is gassing off of nitrogen. And even in the world of fertilizer on a mass scale, application kits that use ammonia, there's some special, it's a specialty tool because one of the issues is volatilization and we have to be able to close the trench and capture that gas before it gases off into the atmosphere. Compost tea and the nitrogen cycle will have, compost tea will have the nitrogen cycle kind of working through it and eventually some of it is going to turn to ammonia and that will be gassed off into the air regardless if you have a lid on it or not. So nitrogen actually may be lower in a compost tea than in an actual compost. So here's the thing, with microbes and compost tea, there will be microbes in it, particularly if it's aerated. Is it more than your compost? You could maybe argue that, particularly if the compost tea is warmer, it's less exposure to UV, it has higher moisture, obviously, everything else. So that, yes, may actually be beneficial in increasing the volume of microbes. We don't know if those microbes are good or bad. It's impossible to tell. Where I get a little bit hung up or my brain just can't quite say yes to is when we actually apply said microbes to the soil or to the plant. Now, one of the claims is you put it on the leaves. Let's go back to the video I did on microbes and the biofilm. So in that, we learned that within soil, there's a biofilm and this biofilm is essentially water. And this water is the home in which microbes sit. And without that, there's no more microbes. A dry soil is a dead soil. That given, if we were to put compost tea onto the leaves of our plant in a sunny, warm day, we have the UV to contend with, which will kill a lot. And then we also have the fact that it's going to dry out. So actual microbes surviving on that leaf surface and just even the idea that those microbes could fight against something bad on that leaf surface, there is not enough to support that. When it comes to placing it into the soil, here's the thing. With any sort of microbe, whether it's additions to the soil via sugar, for example, or additions to the soil via bokashi, or additions to the soil via compost tea, the reality is that you need to have the juice to sustain that population going forward if they even make it there. And your soil, ultimately speaking, it's going to have a limit and it's going to be in 
balance with each other, equilibrium. So eventually you're gonna run out of fuel for this additional microbes you have added, and therefore they're just not going to survive. So long-term, is it doing anything for your microbe community? No. And I'm just gonna throw this out here to begin with. There's no such thing as a soil that's void of microbes. That's just literally not a thing. There's way too many of them and they recolonize way too quickly to have a sterile soil. So if you have soil and it's in mother nature or even your house, there are microbes there. There are ways you can increase them or make them happier via their environment. For example, warm, a little bit warmer or introducing more moisture, but the actual addition of microbes there's a select few cases where you could argue maybe not, but most cases, the addition of microbes in any form, compost here or otherwise, there is not much benefit. But let's get into the one takeaway that I promised you would be good if you went the compost tea route, and that is algae. So here's the thing, algae is actually one of the microbes in soil that is important, and it's also, one of those microbes that can be lacking, particularly in a large production or industrial farm environment. And increasing algae in your soil is actually a good thing. Now, the other one is actually yeast, randomly enough. There's a lot of native yeast that's gone down in our soil populations. Complete side note, my brain just gone. Anyways, um, algae is incredibly beneficial to the soil. I have an entire video on that if you want to check it out. It's quite old, so if you want an updated one, I can definitely do that for you. But adding algae, you don't even have to compost tea. You just need a whole bucket of water and you just need to grow yourself some algae. And Google says to watch that. So I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye. There are five different types of... Oh my God. Why are you so cute? Why? Why are you so cute? Okay, now the other one's coming. Oh my good lord. No, don't make out. Don't make out on top of me. No, oh my good, good goodness graciousness.